Hello, everyone. Happy June. Welcome to the Intellectual Shaman Discussion Series in the International Humanistic Management Association uh, platform. We welcome, as always, Sandra Waddock, uh, who moderates the series. And today we're joined by Ann Sui as well, who will be talking about scientific freedom and scientific responsibility for humanity. Before I turn it over to Sandra and Anne, though, I just again wanted to extend a very warm welcome to everyone on behalf of the International Humanistic Management Association. Uh, we are all about protecting dignity and promoting well being, which is um, more necessary than ever these days. So I'd love to turn it over to Michael Pearson just for a brief welcome as well. Well, thank you, Erica, and, and what a wonderful job you're doing in summarizing the, the, the statement which we are about, which is protecting dignity and promoting well-being. That's as simple as that. And if you go deeper, this is a fundamental challenge to the overarching paradigm that we live by in society, that we manage organizations, that we do research with, and, and in many ways that we live our lives. <laughs> And, and so just being present to that again, it's such a simple statement and has such profound consequences if we, if we adhere to it or we try to adhere to it. And so I see myself and discover, discover myself on that journey of dignity and, and flourishing every day and challenged by it. And, and it's like people like Sandra Wadok or Ansui and Erica and, and you here that are in this journey and have traveled uh, as fellow travelers before or maybe a little bit in the back or or maybe on the side or somewhere. And I think it's in the space that we're creating here that Sandra is hosting the intellectual shaman space where we can learn from each other in our journeys and, and see what can we contribute at a higher level through the research that we do, through the teaching that we do, through the being that we do in, in everyday life. It, however, however flawed and, and, and just mind. Um, so I invite you all to be in this journey. Thank you, Erica, for hosting this amazing. Sandra, you're amazing. Anne, you're a wonderful guiding light. So thank you all for being here. Thanks, thank Michael. you. Thanks, Michael. Um, so just one brief reminder to everyone, if you could please make sure you're muted or we will mute everyone as well when we can. Um, we are recording and this recording will be available following the event. Look for it in your emails over the next few days or so. Um, I will also be posting some information in the chat so you can monitor that as we, as we go through the, the session for about the next hour. Um, there will be some links there that will be useful to you. Um, we will be um, facilitating Q&A with Anne through the chat. So if you have questions, if you have comments, if you have resources you'd like to share, please do share those in the chat um, and, and we'll make sure we, we engage with everyone. Um, so at this point, I would love to turn it over to Sandra Waddock, uh, who I think needs very little introduction. Um, you know, however, I'm, I'm happy to provide a bit of an introduction if, if anyone feels that that's necessary, but I will turn it right over to Sandra in the interest of, of time well spent with Sandra and Anne today. Yeah, thanks, Erica and Michael um, and Ariane in the background doing all the hard work, actually. Um, so I'm really excited to hear Anne's talk about the decline of scientific freedom and responsibility um, in our field and I think bro more broadly. Um, so I don't, you probably all know Anne, at least by reputation. She is the Motorola Professor of International Management Emerita at a Arizona State University, and she's coming to us today from Arizona. She's the distinguished, she has more titles than anyone I've ever seen, actually. She's the distinguished adjunct professor at University of Notre Dame and distinguished visiting professor at Peking University and Fudan University in China. She's served previously on the faculty of Duke, University of California, Irvine, was the founding head of the management department at uh, the Business School of Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Anne has a strong commitment to doctoral education and is a strong advocate, as we'll hear actually in her talk, um, uh, for responsible social science research in business. She's received more awards um, than um, we could possibly know, but let me just make, name uh, a couple of them. 
um, best paper awards from AMJ, ASQ, and the Journal of Management, um, lifetime achievement awards uh, on her for her creative leadership research, um, the University of Minnesota Outstanding Achievement Award, the AOM Distinguished Service Contribution Award, and um, many others that just, I don't want to take up too much time of, of Anne's time. Um, she served also as the 67th president and is now a fellow of the Academy of Management. She was the 14th editor of the AMJ um, and the founding president of the International Association for Chinese Management Research and founding editor of, in chief of Management Organization Review. Um, and the list goes on. So um, without saying any more, because I could probably speak for a whole hour about just Anne's accomplishments. Um, let me turn the floor over to her, and I think she's going to show us some slides to start with. Yes, indeed. Um, thank you, Erica. Thank you, Michael, and thank you, Sandra, for the warm welcome and, and the uh, very flattering introduction. I really don't feel I deserve any. Uh, um, just like all of you, just a researcher, professor in business school and doing my thing, and, and, and I do care. Uh, for all the projects I work on. And that's one of the uh, kind of underlying theme that I feel like we'd be taking away our freedom to do what we really want to do. So I wanted to uh, take, make this a topic of today's conversation. So, so I, if, you, if you would uh, allow me, I'd like to just uh, use a PowerPoint to guide my prepared remarks uh, for the 30 minutes that I was given. And then hopefully we have uh, plenty of time to answer your questions. I'm sure there are lots of questions on this topic and, and hopefully I can stimulate some more thinking along this line. So uh, so let me try to do that. Uh, share, share screen and there's a PowerPoint and share. And now I put it into a, from the start. Okay, how does that look? Good, okay, all right. So. So, um, uh -huh. all right, so now I'm, let, let me just begin. Uh, I'm very honored to have uh, this opportunity to discuss a topic, uh, scientific freedom, which is actually largely um, absent in the management literature. Uh, we don't think about it, we take it for granted. Um, but we do talk about scientific responsibility in the form of ethics, research ethics. But ethics is just a part of scientific responsibility. It is not all of it. It's a much broader concept. So today I wish to clarify these two concepts and share my personal experience with both of these two uh, in my 40 years of research career. In these 40 years, I have observed and experienced the decline uh, of uh, both uh, uh, freedom and responsibility. But there are also signs that I see in the restoration of both in recent years. That's why I want to leave you all with a hope, hopeful future that we are uh, beginning to, to, to go back into where we should be in terms of having both freedom and a tremendous sense of responsibility for what we do, okay? So uh, I will begin by telling you a brief story of my research career, which fell into uh, um, three phases. Uh, and I will focus on uh, scientific freedom and responsibility as I experienced it in each phase. Then I would like to provide the historic context of my career. <clears throat> what is happening in the largest research community? And that led to my observation on the decline of both freedom and responsibility. Uh, next, then I will dive more deeply into these two concepts, clarifying the meaning of each and the relationship between the two. I will discuss how we can restore freedom and responsibility and how each of us can contribute to taking back both. So finally, we'll, we'll devote a hopefully considerable amount of time on discussing the implications of this for, for young scholars uh, or, or not so young scholars. So what I'm about to share uh, today, uh, we're taken largely from these two papers. Mm, one was published early, early this year in the annual review of organizational psychology, organizational behavior. The other one is in press and in journal of management studies. And the JMS paper defined these two terms and discuss how both have declined what we can do you know, and offer many ideas of what we can do and possibly hopefully should do. Uh, and, and also some, some, some information on uh, what some many are already doing to restore both. So uh, let me just go on to the, um, the, the a brief uh, uh, um, three-stage <laughs> career. Uh, it, it fell nearly into three stages and three phases. Of course, it didn't happen that way. It wasn't planned that way. It, it just kind of is a retrospective reconstruction. So, 
So while the life, my life was being lived, I had no idea what the future was going to be. Uh, decisions were made one at a time. Uh, life was lived one day at a time. Uh, but every decision has consequences. And I always try to do a what if analysis, especially on big decisions to avoid major mistakes. And I make my share of mistakes, plenty of them, but a large and uh, a large, largely I, I felt like I, I, I don't have too many regrets. So the any review paper gives many examples of, of the thinking that went into uh, the major decisions, uh, like taking an academic job, uh, at Duke University, instead of going back to the company where I was working for before I started my PhD, like going to Hong Kong in 1995, instead of staying at my cozy job in Irvine, and then all taking early retirement, unexpected early retirement in 2011. Uh, and then as you see, I, my, my career went on and didn't stop and it's not stopping. Uh, I would like to stop it, but it's just kind of, it's under my momentum, it's difficult to stop. And, and and so, um, so that's where we are today, uh, 2022, and uh, there's next chapter uh, to be unfolded. Yeah. All right, so, so the, um, uh, I want to make, uh, maybe uh, let me just go back to previous slide, make two points before I go to the next thing um, about uh, this uh, career. Uh, the first point I want to, uh, to, uh, to make um, uh, is, uh, is uh, in fact, uh, the, the idea of one day at a time, um, uh, making sure you live the day uh, as best as you can, and the rest uh, will follow. The second point I want to make uh, is that we are all authors of our own stories. We are writing our stories every day, okay? And I always mindful that we cannot control outcomes or what actually happened, but we have some control over process uh, or, over, or some influence over what we do or how we feel about what happened. So to me, success is having lived a good day, even a challenging day, or even a bad day, because I made it through that day. So I don't know what next month or next year will be, but I know I can uh, uh, to choose what to do today and how to feel about that day. I can get depressed, I can feel joyful that another day has you know, lived and I wasn't a bit you know, less off for that day. Every morning, got up grateful for having another day to, uh, to do my best uh, for what I know are the important things that should be done. So each action can lead me to one direction versus another direction. So as the author of our own stories, we, I encourage everyone to be mindful of your day every day. <clears throat> so my story is a, it's a, it's about many deliberate decisions and especially some clarity on what is important to me. And I try to keep that in mind every time I make a decision or a choice. So for example, the first decision was in fact going to take an academic job. If I hadn't done that, life would have been very, very different today, right? I decided to take the job at Hong Kong in 1995. I decided not to, life would have been totally different. So every decision has sometimes very major consequences for one's lifetime. So how did I experience freedom, scientific freedom in each phase, okay? So I consider myself as a very traditional practice-inspired researcher in the first phase, okay? I do what everybody else does, so, you know, look at the literature and then look at the world and see what's important, what intrigued me, what motivated me, so I chose some topic. Before my PhD, my professional job was a human resource specialist in a computer manufacturing company. I support the line managers, executives in the human resource activities. Most of these were middle managers, and my dissertation was surprised about middle managers, the, what are their roles and how do we measure their effectiveness or, or, or contribution to the company. So this sensitivity to context defines my research priorities almost my whole life. And you should be able to see the signs of the time or the landscape of the context where I worked, okay? Uh, based on the main research themes of the three phases and know what's happening in the world by looking at what I, what I do research on, okay? So I experienced a high level of scientific freedom in, these, in the first phase. I was told as an assistant professor, always aim for the top journals, as you are, I'm sure. People know, but my, my colleagues know that not all research papers can end up in top journals. So going to the next level was highly acceptable, okay? So that's where we were. Um, 
that some constraint began to appear in the middle of the second phase and I highlighted in red after joining SU kind of from after coming back from Hong Kong. Um, the journal list began to appear. The A, pub, A journal publications became the major evaluation criterion for hiring and for promotion tenure. Doctoral students need A journal articles to be competitive in the marketplace, okay? Students were pushing faculty, me included, to write papers with them um, or for them. <laughs> and, and because they need A publications uh, to be competitive in the job market. It was for me, both troubling and stressful. So 2011 opportunity came to take early retirement and I jumped at it because I was really not very happy with the condition of our field. And I felt like if I continue to work in it, I will be sucked into it more and more. I need to get detached away from it to, to get some sense. You know, I think I can always get another job. You know, lots of people get another job after retirement. So, but I end up didn't get another job, at least not a paid job. So in phase three, beginning in 2011, I focused on trying to understand the nature of the problems um, that pushed me out and work to restore some degree of both freedom, responsibility and scientific work. And also I should say pushed out the young faculty as well. And, and I forgot to mention that, 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 that I titled a talk, Scientific Freedom, Scientific Responsibility for Humanity. And the word humanity, uh, I, I, there are two meanings to it for, for today's talk. The first is the people in our profession, in our field, the faculty, the doctoral students. I feel that we're not treating them very well. I feel that many are suffering. I feel that we don't have enough, give them enough dignity and, and respect their well being, as you can imagine, you know, what I'm talking about, right? All the stress that many young faculty and doctoral students have. So that's one word, the humanity within our profession. And second, is that larger society. We've been catering as a business school faculty in our research and teaching to the top 1%, right? We have not paid enough attention to the 99%, which includes employees, suppliers, customers, society at large, all right? So that's where, where the freedom. So, so I, 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 um, uh, I found that the gradual decline of freedom uh, beginning in the early 2000s is of tremendous, tremendous um, kind of um, onset of, of, of a, a dynamic that's not healthy for our, for our profession. Now, let me, let me turn to the question of scientific responsibility. Uh, what did I understand to be <clears throat> my responsibility in my research and how did I experience it? So in phase one, I saw my responsibility as a researcher was to produce knowledge for practice. In those years, the term filling a gap in the literature was non-existent, at least I was not aware of it. The literature was there to inform us what we know about a problem. The purpose of research is to seek new and different answers to a problem, okay? And that, and the answers are going to be used for practice, to guide practice or policy, inform policy. That's it, it's just that simple. Very traditional, very kind of maybe naive, but that was the way life was and what's good. And then in phase two, I felt responsibility to help Chinese scholars in Hong Kong working, beginning to, 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 uh, to, to visit Chinese universities in, in China, is to help them to learn the international empirical research methods because they want to become more international. They want that engagement with international scholars. And Western scholars want to go to China and study this you know, very interesting uh, uh, region. And so, 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 so I, I create associations and connect the Chinese scholars in the West. So, but in early 2000s, okay, chicken, chicken rice. in early 2000s, several problems became, uh, uh, appear in our field and became salient. The first is the research practice gap or the relevance problem. The second um, is adoption of Western American research paradigm, which are problems, theories, and methods uh, by scholars in the emerging economies, including China. And the third is the prevalence of questionable research practices. And I don't think I need to spell them out. You, you, we're all very familiar with them. Hawking, p-hacking, confirmation, only positive results, uh, hypothesis supporting uh, uh, results are publishable and so forth, okay? So I felt responsibility 
uh, in observing also these problems and and the and the and the and the stress and the mysteries begin mystery begin to appear among the young scholars, uh, and I myself experiencing that that stress, I felt with as a need to 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 join the conversation about what are these problems and what can we do about it. So in phase three, I went full time and full steam, trying to develop solutions to solve the what we call what I call the instrumental rationality instrumental rationale, all for instrumental purposes in doing research. Instrumental, not for well-being and dignity, but for tenure, hiring, reputation of the, of the school and so forth, okay? So, so I helped co-create the responsible research in business and management. So in summary, let me quickly summarize this part. My research career follows the contour of the landscape in a context where I work. During the first 15 years, I worked in the US and in the business, the business problems in the US society were the major focus of my research. In the next phase, I was working in a Chinese context. So I focused on problems in the Chinese society. I also have strong identification with my profession. So I pay attention to our profession as a whole, being in a global context away from North America. You have a different way of looking at the world, looking at, at how we practice our, our, our research. So after noticing some problematic developments, then I turned my attention to the profession as my target of study and writing, including topics of indigenous research around the world, contextualization, right? So let me now uh, bring us back to looking at the field as a whole to see how my career fit into the context of, uh, of, of uh, business and management research. So in the first 50 years uh, of, of, of of business school and business education and research. Um, there were um, uh, most of the research in business schools were case studies and, and, uh, and field studies. And there, these, uh, there were scientific management, uh, such as uh, experiments and, and such a Hawthorne study and, and the, uh, and, and the uh, engineering uh, work uh, uh, in terms of efficiency and so forth. But these were done by industrial engineers or psychologists. Those were not business school research. So by and large, just by and large business schools were seen as trade schools without real science. Research at this stage is highly relevant because the focus was on observing, describing, and explaining uh, actual practices. So a watershed event happened in 1959. Uh, some of you are familiar with this book by Gordon and Howell. Uh, it called for more scientific research in business schools. So business schools began to take research seriously and hire economists, sociologists, and psychologists um, um, to, to work in the business school. So between 1960 and 1980s, Business research became rigorous and, and, and produced most of the major theories that we see in the textbooks today. Okay? So I refer to this stage as the golden age of business research. So uh, uh, in the, uh, the 1990s, uh, we all know there's a uh, rise of industrialization and, and, and globalization in business education also rose in all the emerging economies. And I, I was very close to China at that time. I'm close physically to China <laughs> at that time. So, so I was observing uh, with very curious uh, eye about what's happening, not only in China, but largely in other emerging economies as well. So global, globalization in business education means imitating Western teaching and research practices. So faculty learn the ivory tower uh, research of the West. They copy both the good and the bad. Research in these developing contexts is not to understand, explain, or solve local business problems, but to publish in international journals for legitimacy of business schools, for participating in rankings, accreditation, and so forth. So th this leads to uh, the, the, the homogenization tendency that I uh, the, the wrote about in, in my paper on, uh, 2007 in MJ. So there's convergence of research questions, theories, and methods to what those published in the top journals in the field, and most of them were North American and a few European journals. So now this is a very high level overview of the history. And let me now zoom in on the changes in scientific freedom and responsibility beginning in the 1990s. So 1981 is where my research began. So you can see I was right at the tail end of the golden age, moving into the ivory tower age. So there were three major developments uh, uh, since the 1990s. The first is, in fact, the introduction of the journalist. 
and using the A journal publications as a major criterion for hiring promotion tenure. Now this to me took away the freedom uh, of, of, of us to choose other means of research dissemination. So books, book chapters, speech journals, or sometimes even top journals in other disciplines, in other the base disciplines do not count in promotion and tenure. Authors began to shy away from problems that are difficult to publish in these eight journals, because especially those big problems, messy problems, or problems with a solid literature or theory behind them. So this is a major barrier to scientific freedom, okay? The second development is the uh, priority on theory and on advanced uh, analytical methods for data analysis. This to me takes away uh, from problem solving research without theory or weak theory uh, or pre-theory, uh, policy research and main simple main effect studies. Okay, so editors and reviewers want complex models. Okay, authors try to find data and develop convoluted theories that involve multiple interactions, mediated moderations, moderated mediations, three-way interactions, sometimes they even have four-way interactions. I get dizzy just reading those papers. I don't know how they managed to, to do it. So can you imagine managing, looking at paper, trying to figure out what is it that I can do, under what conditions, what kind of group, you know, what kind of employees, that kind of complexity in theories really does not help practice and does not help us to develop theories that are generalizable to many different contexts. And with the world, we need more general theories and less of that, those complicated uh, uh, multiple uh, interactions. So the third development um, is uh, the, the research practice, pra the questionable research practices that I talked about. Uh, it is to me a result of the need to develop models and results that are pleasing to authors and editors. They want results that are novel or beautiful. Uh, these questionable research practices led to findings that are not generalizable and not replicable, okay? So enough of scientific freedom uh, uh, in terms of how I experience it, how we are beginning to lose it. So let me go back now, just briefly describe, explain what is scientific freedom? When did we begin to know that's important to us? Or is it important? Or do we really have any? Can we do without it? Or must we have it? And so forth. So the history of, of, of uh, scientific freedom really began in the 17th century when the church began to intervene with the scientific work, all right? So some of you are familiar with that history. So scientific freedom uh, is, is, is a classic quote that I always use and I see other people mention as by Kaplan on a, in this book that refer to autonomy inquiry, okay? In general, it, 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 ref, and, and, and it, it refers to uh, the, um, the, 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 uh, the principle that pursuit of truth is accountable to nothing or no one, not a part of the truth itself. In other words, only the scientific community can judge, evaluate what we do, uh, or, or uh, no, no outsiders without their scientific training uh, should be allowed to do so. So the, the, um, uh, the external agencies, uh, such government and religion, uh, largely is, is, is a, a hands-off of, of approach. So scientists have total freedom to decide what problems to study, what methods to use, and how and where to publish their work. Okay, just remember that, how and where to publish their work. So science produces, uh, science is considered as a value-free enterprise. So science produces knowledge and society uses the knowledge. It uh, seems like a good division of labor, but let me ask you this question. So, um, uh, is, from your experience uh, or your observation, is science value free? Can it be? If policymakers do not understand science, okay, what risk is there when they use scientific knowledge? And should scientists be held accountable uh, or responsible for the use of scientific knowledge that led to bad outcomes for society, such as atomic bomb? Nobody put Einstein in jail because he came up with a formula for the atomic bomb, right? So scientists are immune to these misuses, but should they be? Should they have responsibility to anticipate, at least to speak up? And we know later scientists, in fact, to speak up that we have to put a stop to science that's not going to be good for society. The risk of, of damage is greater than the benefit of having that, that knowledge. So that's the idea of forbidden knowledge. So scientists are human beings and they are not omnipotent. They make mistakes. Scientists have made many mistakes. 
So should scientists help be held responsible for the mistakes they make? And what values or whose values should govern scientific work? Okay. So this value-free ideal has lots of debate still going on. So whose values or what values um, in our profession, I, I, I can see we have at least two levels, one institutions. Uh, we can see some governments are for climate research, some are against. Now, if government does not interfere, will we have been further along in our climate research? We don't know, right? So um, there's certainly, uh, there are bans. Uh, I know of one university, the Catholic University does not allow jet stem cell research, right? So there's interference, scientists can argue, but that's important. So stem cell research can create many, many positive benefits of society. Okay, so religious reasons, sanctity of life, prevent a scientist in that institution from pursuing that kind of research. And we have the eight journal publications, universities and departments. Now, who are they to say eight journals are the right ones, right? And we know research show eight journal publications. Does not mean every paper in the eight journal is high quality or could be highly excited or would be having impact, right? So is that, is that a good proxy? So it can go on and on. And as individual scientists, okay, we all judge the scientific work based on some personal preferences. So values are everywhere. We can't avoid it, okay? So, so the question is what to do with it, right? So the value-free ideal is the elusive effects. And I have a paper that discuss uh, some of these issues, okay? So um, scientific uh, uh, freedom uh, has constraints that operates in many level. And there are three, these are the, the uh, three levels of, of constraints. First, institutional level. Schools, universities uh, create the metrics they use to define scientific contribution. The KPIs largely to us is a journal publication, okay? So, so the consequence that scientists are treated as paper writing instruments, right? For the universities, for the schools. Um, what you write on, the, nobody cares, except, you know, we have many groups now come up to say that's wrong, including uh, human, human Humanistic Association. The second is our scientific community ourselves. We put many constraints on the researchers by the standards we emphasize when we review manuscripts. Many authors say well, they do not feel free to have their own voice, or they, in fact, they don't have their voice. Reviewers sometimes act like co-authors. The society at large also have um, expectations of science. Um, uh, we have government funding to science, big time, NSF, right? Uh, and, and army uh, research and, and so forth. Uh, funding is a major empowering or disempowering mechanism for some uh, on some research topics. So not all constraints are bad. For example, the institutional review board that we have to submit when we do survey research or do experiments, they are meant to protect the subjects from being harmed during the research process or using human subjects for any research that potentially bring, bring harm to the, to the human beings. And it came about during World, you know, after World War II, that's become a really big issue. Uh, humans were used for experimentation, okay? So most scientific community agree that science does not, it cannot have total freedom. Some constraints are necessary. However, some constraints can stifle scientific work and progress. And we see that in our own research. So freedom also needs to be accompanied by uh, uh, responsibility. Let me now turn to the question of responsibility, okay? Uh, Schultz, German philosopher Schultz, um, uh, offers a framework uh, to think about the question of responsibility. <clears throat> so three basic questions. Who are we talking about? Who's responsible? Uh, what are they responsible for? Well, for what? And to whom are they responsible? So these three questions are pretty basic, but seem very you know, encompassing to understand responsibility. So applying to our own field, business and management research, um, and the, the RBM position paper uh, that talk about the research ecosystem and the ecosystem comprised of internal stakeholders and external stakeholders, okay? We are all familiar um, uh, with the uh, internal stakeholders, okay? But most of us don't care uh, about or are expected to care about the external stakeholders, the business and geo government, right? We don't even talk about them. I want to talk to them. So, but all members of stakeholders have a stake in the research that we do. And therefore they have a role to play to make sure that our science is solid and useful, okay? So what is science, a scientist responsible for? Here we have 
Uh, and this came from the paper in JGMS paper. We have four types of responsibility. One is general as citizens, so we are citizens. So we are responsible at least minimally to be honest and be ethical, right? Second is expand, as epistemic. When we create science, we have to adhere to basic standards of sound science. Third is our responsibility to society, okay? Uh, in terms of our scientific work, we act as science advisors. Uh, we teach our students. So every word we utter, has consequences. So every data result we put out into the public have consequences, all right? So that's a that society. We need to take their well-being into consideration uh, in our research. And the fourth is contextual, which is we are members of many stakeholders in our research community, both internal and external. As research community, as members, we have a responsibility to play our part, to be a positive member rather than a negative member of those communities. So lastly, the third question, to whom are we responsible for? Here we identify four bases of responsibility or four targets of responsibility. The first one is science itself, okay? Science itself. We, we are responsible in using scientific logic, epistemic standards in conducting science and in evaluating others' work. Now, remember it's epistemic criteria, not ethical social criteria, not because I like that you know, I like SEM, therefore you must use SEM. And that, we don't say it explicitly, but that's in play oftentimes in the minds of the reviewers who are also professors and scientists themselves, okay? So the science itself, we need to be responsible to science itself and be ethical about our work. Second is our community. Uh, we have to contribute to the uh, healthy development of science, training of the next generation of scholars and so forth. And third is, uh, that society and the citizens, we are responsible to them to contribute robust evidence on our discoveries and be thoughtful about any wrong conclusions, okay? The fourth is to ourselves, okay? We, we have responsibility to ourselves in two ways. One is that we have to be objective about what we, in, in, our, in, our, in our evaluation of other people's work. Uh, second, is we need to, to remove our biases and values and, and and, and to apply the best standards. And third is to be good to ourselves, okay? If things are not doing well, you're feeling that totally stressed. You, you know, other people probably feeling the same. As a community, we need to get together and to, to, to take care of ourselves because if we don't feel good about what we do, how can we do good work, right? If you think about it, there's a logic there. So, we, so lastly, we need to have a sense of humility, detachment from our work, that in fact, we all can make mistakes and don't say that this is golden truth, what I have discovered. No, you could be wrong. And oftentimes we're wrong. So we need to have that sense of humility, okay? So applying all of this together to our field, the table one of the JMS paper has sounds all fill out, okay? About um, for what one is responsible, uh, that particular stakeholder uh, group is responsible. So I just want to ask you three questions, okay? All of you, who are you in this research ecosystem? Okay, who are you in this research? Where are you in this system? Second question, yes. Well, what am I responsible for? You can look at that table in that paper and identify a set of things they're responsible for. See, can I, you know, am I responsible for that? I don't feel I'm responsible. Why am I not? Responsible? The third is this question, to whom am I responsible? Because I know most of us to the reviewers, <laughs> to, my, to my department head, but we as scientists go much beyond that, right? All right. So, so, so to just to wrap up, the freedom and responsible uh, has, has interdependence, okay? So there are there's two sides of the, the same coin, they coexist. Freedom without responsibility is abuse of our privileges. It may generate unimaginable consequences if we are not careful about our work. It might potentially bring harmful effects on society. And responsibility without freedom does not offer the conditions necessary for independent science and breakthrough discoveries, okay? So now I want to offer you a quote, a statement issued by the American Association for Advancement of Science in 2017, a formal statement. Scientific freedom and scientific responsibility are essential to advance some human knowledge. Okay, scientific freedom is that, we've defined it, is intricately linked to the intricately linked and must be exercised in accordance with scientific responsibility and responsibility is duty to conduct and apply science with integrity in the interest of humanity, in the spirit of stewardship for the environment and with respect for the human right and human dignity. 
totally consistent with the value of humanistic uh, management. Okay, so I'm going to skip this page in the interest of time, and and uh, just uh, just to uh, uh, say on this table in the paper, I would invite you to think about of all the actions suggested, some are light, some are heavy. What action can you take, uh, uh, or should you take to help increase both in, uh, with freedom and responsibility? Okay, and then also. Which who, which group or individual can I influence uh, to help bring about some changes in this area? All right. So this is my last page. I want to end by offering you one last thought. One that is the idea of scientific norms. We have many norms now guiding our work. Okay. I'm sure you can list a bunch of them. APUPs are important, that's a norm, okay? And do what the review asks you to, that's a norm, right? So, uh, but those norms may not be conducive to, to good science. So Merton offered uh, something called the ethos of science, okay? And uh, we added two more uh, norms. One is independence, we need to have the freedom. Impartiality, impersonal criteria, objective process to conduct and evaluate. Communality, discoveries are public good. So this is speaking against the, the, the paywall that all the publishers have in, 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 in the articles that we write, okay? And that is a problem. We need to have more free access uh, to our publications. Uh, detachment of ourselves uh, from, from our personal needs and benefits. True scientific work is a calling, some, a degree of humility be skeptical about not only others' work, but about your own work as well. And lastly, reflexivity. And uh, then have a clear knowledge about who you are, where you are in the society, in the world, and, 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 and how can you be a positive agent of change through our research, through our teaching. So with that, I apologize for the very rapid, but I want to make sure we got enough time for us to, uh, to have uh, some Q&A. So I'm going to stop share. Sandra, is that okay? That's great. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, and we have a number of really interesting questions uh, um, in the chat, which I'll get to in just a second. But I wanted you to talk a little bit about the movement, if you will, that you started, the Responsible Research in Business and Management. What motivated you to go there, and what do you think it can accomplish, and what do you encourage our colleagues to do with respect to it? Are you referring to the uh, Responsible Research in Business and Management, RBM? Movement, which began in 2015, and 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 now uh, at least uh, seven years, eight years now, we have a uh, a kind of a status uh, a report uh, in a paper published in a, in a journal called Global Focus, uh, EFMD journal. Um, a seven uh, look back to small wins, uh, some small wins, and some bold uh, actions. We call for some more bold actions. So clearly the impetus to create that was the two problems, uh, three problems I talked about. The credibility crisis, uh, the research practice gap, and the homogenization tendency. All the research scholars are doing the same set of questions, right? And not, not attending to a local, local needs. Um, and it's a global movement. Um, uh, it's multidisciplinary, uh, not only management, we have um, accounting, finance, marketing operations, so in it. Um, and, and the idea is to help uh, uh, create that momentum call for change, engage in change. And I, I guess I would say a couple uh, really uh, accomplishments that we feel are making some, uh, some, some difference. One is the uh, research the awards. Uh, we have responsible research awards, identifying papers that meets the criteria of both rigor and relevant that follows the principles of responsible research with seven principles. So if you are not familiar with the paper, I encourage you to go read it. Um, and it's read by 28 people and, and over a three year period, it's a very thoughtful paper about where things were, are, and we would, what it would like to be. It begins with a vision for 2030, all right? So, so now we have this award, it's, it, it has over a hundred papers in three disciplines, marketing, operations, and management that can show you what responsible research is. Because many people ask us, what is responsible research? How do I do responsible research? What does a paper in responsible research look like? So we have many, many examples now that you can go to the website and, and read them. And that's one big event, one big accomplishment. Uh, 
Uh, and then the second one is if, if universities care for accreditation, which is a big thing that is also going to uh, be different. Accreditation is now asking for societal impact of your research uh, uh, as, a, as a criteria attached to research uh, uh, contributions. So faculty will be asked to, to report what has been the practical impact of your research. Have it been used in policy making? Have you testified in Congress about the real research on the racial issues, or whatever, right? And so that's going to matter. Okay, so you, you have more of that kind of research under your belt, the more likely you're going to get hired, you're going to get promoted, you're going to get, you know, get rewarded. So, so get ready, you know, those research are going to be very important. Uh, so pay attention to the 99%. And, 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 and there are plenty of people catering and the 1%. We don't need to join them. They won't get any less attention if we don't pay attention to them. For those of you who care for 99%, please do uh, have the courage and be prepared because that will be the future of, of, man, of business research. You can, you know, read my lips, it's going, it's coming on the way, all right? So that's, that's kind of a brief, brief answer to your question. Thank you. I think I can see that you're really passionate about this. And I have <laughs> questions, but I want to get to some of our, our participants. Um, so Angela Chen, you have posted a number of questions. I wonder if you could unmute yourself and maybe ask the one that's most pressing for you. And if we have time, we'll come back around. Are you there, Angela? Yeah. I'm just wondering what you think the role of governments are in terms of um, helping with the scientific responsibility and freedom, because that's sometimes they fund the universities or they may have metrics or requirements, you know, for publications or something. That's how they judge. So I'm just wondering what your thoughts are. Okay. Do you live in UK? I live in Australia. Okay. Similar. Yes. Yes. I know the UK is Australia, the Commonwealth, part of the UK system. Uh, with their research assessment exercise every five, six years or so. And they are asking for, for impact on society because uh, 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 two years ago, three years ago, they just get fed through the second phase. It was 10%, now this 25%, I think, weight put on the research funding uh, uh, on, uh, on societal impact of your research. Uh, government plays a big role through funding, for sure. You know, they can discontinue funding on some areas. They can continue funding some areas. And, um, and so that's why we need legislatures, we need government policy, uh, politicians who care about the world to be politicians, but those that don't care about the world, we, we, we in big, big trouble. And we know we have plenty of them in the US <laughs> that don't care about the world. So absolutely, yeah, government plays a role. So, so we have government as an external stakeholder in our ecosystem framework, yes. Thanks. Um, Joel, so you, you, you let the right politicians to government. That's where you can have a voice. Thanks, Anne. Um, Joel Harmon, are you still there? Would you like to ask one of your questions? Yes, thank you. Uh, for those of the many of us who are pretty passionate about trying to make a positive difference, it, it's, it seems kind of necessary to take a, a, a clear-eyed look at the systems that we're in and try to, you know, discover the levers for, for possible change. And looking at this scholarly system that we've kind of frozen in place uh, over many, many years. Uh, you know, I don't know if it's a conspiracy or just, uh, just it just happened. Uh, where, where, where do you see the most uh, potent levers for us to begin to work on to actually start to ch change this system? Okay, thank you for the question. That's a very, very important question. That's a question that that I lose sleep over it. Mm -hmm. um, by and large, we created the problem. Senior scholars who are on tenure promotion committees, who are editors, who are associate editors, who define the rules of the game, right? Uh, created this a journalist, okay? Uh, not they didn't create a journalist, they created a list that we should go by, we should in the files. So the biggest leverage are senior scholars, but they are the biggest obstacle too, because many of them have succeeded so well under the current system and they created it. They do not want to change. And not only that, the pride is involved. The second is basic human laziness. We're too busy. We have too much to do. Can you imagine I have to read every paper of the faculty that's coming for the promotion and tenure? I mean, I don't want to read all of them. I delegate it. I just say, you know, the eight journal publications are good enough. It's been through, you know, the, the ringers. So why trust them? 
Yeah, the reality is we can't trust them, right? And I know for professors with only 200 citations, but tons of age journal publications, right? You know, so, so yeah, no, it's, that's not an easy answer to that. Uh, ASCSB tried to do its part to sneak it through the accreditations. Hopefully it will make a small difference, maybe hopefully a big difference, but unless our senior faculty, uh, uh, more of them, more of them join to say, this is wrong, this is bad. We have to find a creative way to read the papers. Maybe we divide each person, read one paper and some forth. We, we cannot be lazy and not read papers and, and trust the journals. And we care about what faculty do research on and not only how many papers they write. Unless they change in their mind, it's that mindset. Unless that's changed, I, uh, it's going to be slow. And the next hope I have is in young scholars, the assistant professors today and the doctoral students. If we can convince them they have power to change, okay? That they in fact have power to change. When one is very dramatic, short term, stop submitting to the journals. You can't do that, right? Change the topics of your research because journals can only publish what they receive. So if most of the people come in are about society problems and journals are making invitations now. AMJ says, join the conversations in society, not join the conversation in the literature, right? That word, one word change can make a big difference. So yeah, just, so, so last thing I want to answer your question, Joe, everyone is a leverage one. We, each one of us is a leverage one. We all can make a difference, sometimes small, sometimes big, but we all can make a difference. That's why I ask, you know, ask yourself, what can I, where am I in the ecosystem? What can I do? And who can I convince to do something? Mm, thank okay. You. Sorry, thank no quick you. answer to that. No easy answer to that. I, I think that's true because we're really talking about a ecosystem. System transformation here. And uh, yeah. Um, so, um, oh, uh, Ravi, uh, where'd you go? Chinta, you had a couple of questions. Could you pick one and maybe ask Anne? Yeah, uh, as it's an excellent presentation. Thank you very much. A lot of uh, uh, thoughts and insights. I really appreciate that. I would like to get the PowerPoint so that I can read through that again. But then the main point I have is the, the, in terms of the scope, the common thread in everything that you have stated is the business. The term appears in everything that you stated in the research and the publications and so forth. And uh, that I think is a self-limiting uh, in terms of scope, uh, because at the your main point is to become more pro-social, uh, contribute to the 99% and uh, non-business and the bottom of the pyramid and the large unaddressed uh, segments of society and so forth. So that's where I have a little bit of struggle. How do you transform the system to use Sandra's term? system uh, redesign when the limiting uh, uh, term is business everything is business related okay may i uh, you should i ask uh, and try to answer this question now okay all right um uh, maybe i misunderstood your question but but what i was trying to say when I say the 99% I do not mean that we study society directly we study poverty problem directly uh, and that gets back to your question of uh, the point about business. I mean, we in the business schools, we need to turn business school into positive agents of change. Okay, so we need to help businesses to be better employers, caring more about society, caring more about employees, caring more about customers and supply chain and so forth. So we need to turn business into uh, a stakeholder orientation, not a shareholder orientation only. That's where we have the leverage when we teach students. Okay, and I know business at least they say they try to do that. You know, the, the, the business round table, 198 CEOs of America, the biggest corporation in America have a public statement about, we now create wealth for everybody and not just for shareholders. So, so, the, so it seems that always the landscape is ready. Now it's up to us in business school to really help them to do what they wanted to do and that more research is needed. So when business that we care, we want to care for the 99%, they don't use those words, but that's what basically I use those words, then we need to help do research to support that. And, and, and so, uh, so hopefully it's not as narrow as it seems to be. And, and I really feel that uh, de develop, you know, each, each solving injustice issues and poverty issues, we need to look at it from a business point of view, because we are producing students working business. 
what a nonprofit nonprofit is also a business. <laughs> they manage like a business, right? So 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 we need uh, we need to um, to uh, uh, that's why I say business and organizations research and management research um, to uh, to let the uh, direct problems of poverty and equity be in the human in social sciences, and we deal it from an angle of 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 the business context, organizational context. Yeah. Thanks, Anne. We have some other questions, but I know you wanted five minutes at the end to synthesize. Um, it's about five of one now, our time uh, here. So would you like to do that or would you like to take another question? Uh, I, I would like to do that, but I would invite those of you who have questions for me and I didn't get to answer them, please feel free to email me. I'll be happy to engage in a conversation with you. As you know, I really feel very passionate about this problem. And, and I, I can go on and on. <laughs> you give me three days. I can I don't have the physical energy to, to last that long, but I, I have the, 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 the desire to. So please do that, OK? If you can email me, I'll be happy to do that. So let, let's just have a few landing slides to kind of uh, um, uh, hopefully we end with a more uh, positive um, uh, uh, view. So let me just uh, get to the end of that. Okay. All right. So, oh, can you see that now? Yeah. Okay. All right. So this is um, uh, where I see myself in the next um, several years. Um, as long as my energy holds up, uh, my commitment is not to doctoral education because I really mean that our young scholars is our future, right? And if we get our young scholar to empower them, equip them, uh, enable them, uh, energize them, and so forth, then I feel that the, uh, it's a longer process than than, than somebody in that PNT committee said. <laughs> Let's change the criteria, but but I, I think this this has to happen because we cannot go on our current condition. Uh, for, for, for too long. And there's conversations about business schools are, are engaged in change. Oh, I just, at this point, I want to mention there are a bunch of business schools, the top 15 business schools around the country in the US are actually talking, meeting about, uh, about a similar topic, you know, and get more engagement with society. So I, I want to do a little bit of an advertisement of, of what we are doing in RBM for young scholars. Uh, we have this course, um, which is a, a free online course. Uh, uh, once once a week over actually 12 weeks, we have two or three one week break in between. And, and you're welcome to, to join us. Uh, application deadline was actually today. So but if you email me and say you want a day to prepare it, we, 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 we certainly can um, accommodate that. And then there's next is a day to care dissertation scholarship uh, it's to do about reducing injustice in organizations in society focusing on the role of business, all right? So last year we funded seven scholarships at $10,000 each. And uh, this next year we're going to uh, uh, be looking at possibly giving up to 10 scholarships at uh, $10,000 also. So, so if you have interest in doing research on injustice problems, uh, a variety, racial, uh, gender, ethnicity, economic, and other kind of uh, social injustice, uh, please uh, go to the website and re read the requirements and, 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 and submit your proposal. So uh, for young scholars, um, what is the implication for you? How and where to make a contribution? We all want to make a contribution, um, uh, whether you are old or young. And, and so uh, for me, the most important thing is really be well-trained in methods and understanding what science, okay? And to pay attention to, 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 to what's happening around the world and work on problems that really matters to you and to society and be wise in your choices. You know, you're invited, you're tempted to join writing papers that you don't have an interest in, but it's a quick paper, it's another paper, but what for, right? Think about it. At the end of life, you know, uh, I, mean, I am convinced you have 10 wonderful papers in your lifetime versus hundreds of, or a thousand, you know, or even a hundred papers that don't matter. and. Uh, your, your own sense of well-being is, is different and, and be confident about what you can contribute and don't compare yourself to others. And, and in terms of RLs, how many papers, I mean, science is not about counting. Science is about solving problems, okay? 
And so to be successful uh, uh, in, in your career, choosing the right topic is critical. Uh, work on something different. Uh, and, uh, and of course, uh, number three, in bipartisan survival and impact, uh, the system has not fully changed yet. Yeah, you need a job, you need to be promoted. Um, yes, uh, you need to uh, write some papers that, 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 uh, that to, to meet the quantitative requirement, but be sure allow, give yourself the, the, the joy of having some projects that you care for a lot that will make you smile when you work on it, okay? So, so and, and then the, now if this career is right for me, you know, when I was assistant professor, I, I thought about tenure and everything, you know, we have conversations. And I always say, you know, I don't care. I do what I do. If I don't get tenure, I'll be an executive secretary, make lots of money and, and control my boss. So I, and I always have alternative in mind that if this is not for me, something else better could, 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 I could have. So, so don't feel that this is the, you know, you know, there's everything for you. And knowing whether this career is right for you is very important. And then join a community to give and receive support. And, and, and the, uh, the community uh, uh, I'm thinking of is actually one of them is uh, the human resource. Hum, hum, why am I always saying human resource? Because that's my profession. The Humanist Association, Humanist Management Association, and the ones RBM. So have your own definition of success and joy, okay? Uh, don't let other people's success and joy define you, okay? All right, so this is a community, RBM, my invitation to some uh, to you to, to read our website and join us. Um, and this vision uh, uh, that business school and scholars transform their research towards responsible science, produce incredible useful knowledge that address problems important to business and society and to ourselves, okay? So, so uh, one last piece of advice, there's a quote from this book by Mills, it says the bureaucratic rationality, that is impersonal criteria for evaluation and instrumental rationality, that is we focus on promotion tenure only, have turned researchers into what uh, Mills call cheerful robots, working behind a facade of neutrality, impartiality, or objectivity. And we know, in fact, we're not even under behind the facade, we are cheerful robots working without neutrality, without impartiality, without uh, objectivity, as long as it gets published. That's a very cynical, critical statement that I'm making, but I hope you get the point that we need to be better to ourselves, okay? All right, so at Bright Futures Insight, we have motivated young scholars. They want meaning in their work. We have caring senior scholars. Um, they're working very hard to research, change the research culture. And we have enlightened editors. They are promoting credible and useful science. And many actions are being taken by different stakeholders in the research ecosystem. So for you, uh, young people, be patient, be positive, be focused, develop your skills, stay committed, have faith in the process and the power of the collective, okay? So finally, Albert Einstein, my favorite scientist of all times, the development of science and of the creative activity of the spirit requires a freedom that consists in the independence of thought from the restriction of authoritarian and social prejudice. And when I hear, see those three words, I think about promotion tenure committees, I think about universities wanting reputation and ranking and so forth. Okay, so let's try to free ourselves from those restrictions. And concern for making life better for ordinary humans, the 99% must be the chief objective of science. Never forget that when you write your papers. Okay, I think that's it. So thank you again very much for the privilege to spare, share the time with you. And uh, thank you, Sandra. Thank you, Erica. And thank you, Michael. And thanks to all of you. Thank you, Anne. That was a terrific talk and much needed. Um, I hope many other people who signed up and didn't manage to make it get to view it because you have so much um, wisdom to share, especially with people who are newer in our field. Um, and uh, I just want to thank you for giving your time today and thank you everybody who was on the call for showing up. Thank you, Erica and Michael for organizing the system behind all of this. And again, on behalf of the International Humanistic Management Association, just gigantic thanks, Sandra. And thank you for sharing your wisdom. 
um, and encouraging us to exercise both our freedom and our responsibility. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Have a great Bye. weekend. Have a great day. You too.